Chamber. Programme signed. Okay, we're in public session. Declare the meeting open then to the public. Can I inform members that Gemma Dolan, MLA, uh, will be yeah. joining the meeting through teleconferencing? Very good to hear you, Gemma. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. We can hear you okay. Can you hear us okay? Is volume okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I ask members to ensure that their electronic devices are switched to mute mode when they aren't speaking in order to ensure quality of sound recording? If members are content, we'll proceed through the agenda. Uh, apologies. Are there any apologies? I think we're all pretty much attendance, except for uh, the chairperson, of course, who will be late. We'll probably need to mark that down for the record. Um, can I remind members they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests at each committee meeting as applicable? Are there any members wishing to do so? I have an interest in the private members, bill. Okay, Jim. Thank you. Noted. Uh, draft minutes of the proceedings then of the 13th of May 2020. Can I inform members the draft minutes of the meeting uh, on the 13th of May are on page 4? Committee Pat, can I ask members if they are content that the draft minutes are accurate records of the proceedings? Members agreed? Okay, if we're agreed, then the minutes will be published on the website. Matters arising then. The functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Can I inform members following the oral evidence session on the bill on the 13th of May, the addition of a further question to the Department was suggested regarding job evaluation of the private secretary's role. And the email was issued on the 14th of May uh, to members seeking informal agreement for this additional question. Can I inform members that uh, the informal responses confirming agreement were received from the chairperson, uh, Gemma, uh, Jim Alistair, Jim Wells, uh, Yelosa, and myself. Our, uh, can I seek agreement then uh, for the purpose of recording in the minutes? to include a question to the Department as to how the job evaluation and grading support uh, was implemented for the upgrading of the private secretary's role. Members agreed? Okay. Uh, rates relief then. Can I remind members the UUEPC paper on policy advice to the Minister on rates relief was circulated to the committee yesterday? Uh, Jim, just on that wee piece there, on that note then. I, I spoke to the chair about this and uh, he suggested that it might be a, a good idea to um, take oral evidence from them, but that there was no immediate urgency on it as things might become clearer in the next couple of weeks. He maybe suggested the 1st of July. Okay, are members content then with that? So we can move on. Okay. Okay, then uh, item number four then is the oral evidence briefing on the budget. Uh, budget number two. Bill and then the vote on account, the Department of Finance. Here's the chairperson. Oh, is he here? There he is. Apologies, everybody. Okay, uh, Gemma, just so you know, I'm vacating the chair because the chairman has arrived. No problem. Very much indeed, Mr. Deputy. Thank you. Apologies, everybody, for being adrift. Welcome. How far did we get, Paul? Uh, just, we were just about to commence. I hadn't got to the point of welcoming our, our present uh, our presenters. We're about to welcome start of item four. Sir. Item four. OK, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, committee, uh, today we're taking uh, the oral evidence in budget, budget number two, bill and vote on account, Department of Offence. Uh, finance, not offence. Sort of Freudian slip there. I must have been saying that. Now. Joanne, are you with us? Yeah. I am, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. And um, I'd like to welcome uh, Miss Joanne McBurney, uh, Mrs. Emir Morelli, welcome again. Barry, we seem to be becoming long lost friends at this committee as we go through. I'd like to remind members' attention the agenda item has been recorded by Hansard. I'd like to draw members' attention to the following papers relating to the agenda item Clark's briefing paper at page 12, <laughs> Department Budget Number 2 Bill, background paper, page 14. The Department's Northern Ireland Estimates, further vote on account 2021, page 22. The Budget Number 2, Bill 2020, page 34. 
Budget No. 2 Bill Explanatory and Financial Memorandum, page 62, and the Department's response to the raised paper regarding coordinated budget scrutiny on page 67. Uh, Joanne, would you like to make an opening statement? Chair, Emer is going to make the opening statement. Right. That's okay. okay, as she's there in person. Okay. Thank Over you, Chair. You. Uh, when I was here on the 29th of April, I explained the combination of circumstances which has led to the Executive agreeing to ask the Assembly to pass a Budget No. 2 Bill to approve a further vote on account. This vote on account will provide authority for departments to continue to operate through the current COVID-19 emergency period, and the main estimates will be delayed until the autumn when finances are in a more stable position. This has been driven by the critical need to secure access to cash for departments to continue to deliver services in the face of the evolving COVID-19 situation, as there is a very high risk that a number of departments could reach the limit of cash authorised in the Budget Act Northern Ireland 2020 before a budget bill and main estimates could go through the Assembly and receive royal assent if we were to follow the normal process. This problem is compounded by the fast-paced nature of the Executive's response to the COVID emergency, which means that an estimates document would almost certainly be obsolete before it could even be completed, as the public expenditure position would have moved on so rapidly. Indeed, the Executive's decision on further allocations this week, Monday the 18th of May, illustrates this point well. The departments which are at most imminent risk of reaching their cash limits are the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Department of Education, Department for the Economy, Department for Infrastructure and the Department of Finance. This continues to be an evolving situation and DOF is working, is continuing to work closely with colleagues and finance branches within Not health? Not health, no. Right. Must be because it's a very well-run department then. It has a lot uh, of money. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, although, the, although the allocations that have been made to the Department of Health are large in overall terms, bearing in mind the size of the overall health budget to begin with, it, it, some of the other departments have actually percentage-wise had a, a larger increase. So that's... the the explanation. Okay. Thank you. This continues to be an evolving situation and as I said we're continuing to work closely with colleagues and finance branches within departments to monitor their cash position. The most recent returns provided to the Department of Finance indicate that it is possible that the first department, Economy, could reach its cash limits by the 19th of June. I would like to stress that the amounts contained in the voting account do not represent a set expenditure position. This is not an attempt to set a 2021 budget position. As you are aware, the Assembly did approve a 2021 opening budget position on the 5th of May, but that position could not contain many of the additional allocations which have since been made and will continue to be made in response to COVID-19. Rather, this voting account is based on a percentage of each department's 2019-20 provision, albeit that the percentage for each has been calculated to reflect their likely cash and resource requirements in 2021, including the impact of COVID-19. It will extend the existing 45% voting account provided in the Budget Act Northern Ireland 2020 to a much greater level to ensure that all departments will have sufficient cash to continue to provide services until the end of October. In normal circumstances, a voting account would apply a uniform percentage of the previous year's provision to all departments. That is not possible in the current circumstances. The COVID-19 response has not impacted all departments in the same way, and the additional allocations made by the Executive in its response have been targeted specifically at individual departments which have faced the highest priority pressures. Um, if it helps the committee, I would now like to take you through how we've arrived at the appropriate voting account amount for each department. Yes, please. So to do that, we followed um, a series of steps. So step one. As a starting point, the cash requirement was calculated for each department's full year expenditure based on the Executive's 2021 opening budget as agreed by the Assembly on the 5th of May. Step 2. As this voting account is not intended to provide departments with access to cash for a full year, but rather only until the end of October, this figure was then reduced to 80%. The 80% figure was chosen to balance the need to secure sufficient funding to each department under the current situation against the Assembly's need to be able to make an informed decision regarding the full year's expenditure when the main estimates are presented in the autumn. This takes into account that some departments are front-loading payments to the early part of this financial year as part of the Executive's efforts to support suppliers, 
the voluntary and community sector and other organisations which rely on government funding. Step three, the executive has agreed a number of specific allocations as part of its COVID-19 response, funded from the Barnet allocations as a result of the additional UK government expenditure. So to ensure that these departments have the ability to access the cash required to utilise these budget allocations, DOF has added the equivalent sum to the amount being proposed for the voting account. These are for the amounts agreed by the Executive prior to the 18th of May. As you are aware, the Executive met on the 18th of May and agreed a number of further allocations for COVID measures. So while these further allocations have not been used in the calculation of the voting account, the combination of using 80% of the full year's cash requirement in step two, together with the account that has been taken of funding set aside for future allocations, which I will explain in a moment under step four, means that departments will have access to sufficient cash to make use of these further allocations. Mm. Step four, the executive has agreed to set aside funding with the intention of making further allocations. Some of these are for agreed specific purposes, for example, transport issues. Others have not yet been specified. Where it was possible to make an informed judgment as to where these future allocations will be directed, then these have been incorporated into our calculations for the proposed vote and account for the departments concerned. I would stress that this should not be taken as confirmation that the executive has or will agree these allocations to these departments. Rather, it is simply a working assumption that DOF has used to be as confident as we can be that the vote and account will provide the departments with the cash required if the executive does agree an allocation. Step five, as the voting account contained in the budget number two bill is set as a percentage of the previous year's provision, the anticipated cash requirement calculated through these steps was then expressed as a percentage, rounded to the nearest 5% of the provision voted in the 2019-20 spring supplementary estimates. Each of these steps with the figures is set out in the table provided in the briefing paper, and I should point out that the percentage shown includes the 45% approximate amount already authorised in the Budget Act Northern Ireland 2020, with this Budget Number 2 Bill providing the balance. So for clarity, yes. through all our various steps, <laughs> what we're looking at is 80% plus what's in the extra money that's come through from COVID, which should give sufficient to cover the expenses of these departments out to the middle of autumn until we, if we get our main estimates by then. Yes. Um, I believe that the recent decisions made by the Executive on the 18th of May illustrate well the value of the flexibility which this further voting account provides, and it demonstrates the difficulties which would have been created had we attempted to proceed with the main estimates in the normal way. If the Committee has any questions, we will be glad to provide any further information that you require to assist you in arriving at the decision on approving the accelerated passage of the Bill. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm not sure I've yet got it why we can't simply do a main estimate on the figures which are in step one at page 18 of the opening budget cash requirement. And they ask that question because against all the reasons you've articulated is the reality, is it not, that Westminster has been able to take through its main estimates. Now, if it can do that, why can we not do it? If I can give you uh, two issues that that would create. Uh, first one, if, if you look at, at the table one, yes. uh, the Department for the Economy. This is page 18. Uh, on page, sorry, sorry uh, um, just number, table one in the, in the briefing paper. Yes, table if you, one. If, yes. if you look, for example, to the Department for the Economy. Yes. Had we uh, brought forward main estimates based on the opening position for the Department for the Economy, it would actually be significantly less than what the Department is now actually going to need for this year. It will be 64. B because yeah. of the level of additional allocations that have but been But that's made. the only department that would be less than what's in the first column. Isn't that right? So you could build in to your main estimates extra for the economy. 
didn't you? Well, as we explained the last time we were here, to, to we would always seek to write the estimates to the executive's agreed budget position. That moved up very rapidly after the start of the financial year because of the COVID response. And again, we, we don't know what further allocations may be coming down the line, as indeed, as uh, the statement the Finance Minister made yesterday demonstrated, there, there are and continue to be further allocations. So, uh, That's the same situation nationally. The, the, the difference is the second point that was going to come on to. The UK government departments uh, operate with what are referred to as departmental unallocated provisions. So, whenever they bring their main estimate forward, as well as all of the planned expenditure that that department has, it, it also contains an amount which is not allocated for particular function at that stage in the year. The Northern Ireland Executive do not operate with unallocated provisions. The, uh, the, f the full amount of the Northern Ireland block that's available is allocated out to so for services. So just explain to me, if in Westminster the Chancellor has to find and give more money post-budget to various departments. Why is that done? It, it's, in, in Westminster, it's possible that they may, and again, I, I, I'm not sure of the, the detail of their figures, it is possible that they may have to take a further supplementary estimate at a later stage in the year. I, I'm not, sh not sure if, if that will be the case. The or not. mechanism of supplementary estimate was equally open to you. You could have done your main estimates out of the figures in the bill, with something extra for the economy, with the option of a supplementary estimate, shouldn't you? It, it's, it's possible that we could have brought a further supplementary estimate. The effect would have still been the same, that there would have been a, an additional budget bill. The other point year. that was puzzling me is, I'm sorry, I'm talking about, well, table one and table two, in your terms, I think, pages 18 and pages 29 of the pack. Uh, when you look at the anticipated cash requirement to the end of October in column that's marked sum of one to four in table one, you see yes. that? Yes. Why is that figure different from the budget figure in table two, where it totals out at 16 um, billion? Because, as we explained, in order in order to set the vote on account as a percentage of the 1920 expenditure, we took the the figure that's in column that column sum one to four, and then expressed that to the nearest five percent of the 1920 provision. So that's why in the the right hand column of that table you'll see that that is. Uh, rounded to the nearest 5%, what that represents as a percentage of the 1920 provision. But the and then it was that percentage of the 1920 provision that we have uh, included as the, the cash and resource sums in the budget bill. Well, just to help me, when you total what's on table one, it comes to 15.94 billion. The total on table two on the cash table is 16.188, which is a difference of what, 250 million roughly. Is that a difference simply caused by rounding? Yes, it, it, that, it's that rounding of the percentage. Which is the real figure? 5%. Sorry? Which is the real figure? It, it was the, the the figure that's in the, the vote on account document is the figure that appears in the budget bill. So that is the, the real figure. Sorry, which figure appears in the budget bill? The f further further cash required on account, which is column table two of the vote on account document. Yeah, the 16 uh, billion one. Yes. Uh, well, it's, it's the, the 16 billion is the sum of the amount that was voted on account yes. in the Budget Act in March. Yes plus the additional amount being asked to be voted on account this time round. So but am I wrong then to assume that that 16 billion figure in table two should really be the same as the figure in the anticipated cash requirement? 
But uh, as I've explained, we took that anticipated cash requirement, expressed it as a percentage of the 1920 uh, provision, rounded to the nearest 5%. So that, that is why you're correct to say that the 16 million figure is different than the sum of the anticipated cash requirements, sum uh, columns one to four, because for each department we took that, expressed it as a percentage of the 1920 provision, rounded to the nearest 5%. percent i have set, set the uh, percentages out in the, uh, the briefing paper. But the precise figure is the one in Table 2. The, the Table 2 is the figure which is for which authority is being sought in the Budget Act, and that represents a percentage of each department's provision in the 1920 Spring Supplementary Estimates. Just finally, what we have here are pretty global figures for each department. Is there no reason? Is there any reason why we couldn't have been given figures of spending areas across each department? That 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 would have been the main estimates. Yeah, we're going uh, to go through this year on estimates, which have never given us the spending areas. Why couldn't that be in these estimates? They will, they will be when the main estimates are brought to the assembly. Yes, but why couldn't that principle be applied to these to provide, supplementary to, estimates? To, to provide the detail of that, it would not have been possible for us to have provided the detail of that that would be required for the main estimates in the constantly changing public expenditure position that we're in, because ordinarily we would write the main estimates to the opening budget position. And then during the course of the year, there would be a series of usually three monitoring rounds, normally one in June, one in September, and one in January. What, what we have effectively had is the equivalent of three monitoring rounds in the past five weeks, in which the yeah. executive have been changing their uh, budget allocations in response to the, the COVID situation. So uh, had we started to try to produce a main estimates document uh, at the beginning of April, based on that opening budget position. Within a week, it would have been out of date. Within another week, it would have been out of date again. And then as of Monday, it would have been out of date again. So that, that's why we, we can't provide the, the, the breakdown by spending area. We, uh, to fa you've, for example, in the time that we presented the paper to you last week, and we've met today, that, that will have changed again because of the uh, decisions made by the executive on Monday. And then there'll be a formal June monitoring as well, won't there? It, it is the intention to have a, a June monitoring round, which will, as well as capturing a lot of the, the, the detail in terms of those allocations and exactly which spending areas and departments it'll score against, uh, it'll, it'll also give uh, departments and ministers the opportunity to consider the, the detail of the budget allocation, uh, the opening budget allocations, which were agreed uh, by the Assembly on the 5th of May. And that will be the first insight we'll have into whether any departments in these circumstances are saving money. That's, that's certainly one of the things that will be drawn out in the June monitoring but the, Whether or not they're saving money is not informing these, esti these estimates. The, what, what's informing the estimates is the allocations that were made by the executive. That, that in turn, was informed by the pressures uh, that were identified by the ministers to the executive. Yes, but we may be allocating money, huge amounts of money, to a department, which, because of the reality of the situation, be it invest in I or ever, doesn't need it. Can't spend the money. And, and that is, that is yeah, we're assuming they are. That is certainly one of the things which will be considered by the executive in the June monitoring round. But if, were we to delay bringing this bill forward until that was carried out, as I explained, there's potentially a department that will run out of cash in the intervening time. I see. Well, I'm not sure if I do, but yeah, thanks. Mm.
Yeah. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, can I ask? And uh, maybe this is something that has been answered through Jim's question. Why is it that we're going on percentages for 1920 when every other line is the 2021? And, and really, step one, the first column, to me, is the most important there because ultimately that's the opening cash requirement. So why are we taking a measurement, a percentage measurement of effectively last year's budget? It's the the way of the, the way a vote on account is c calculated is is as a percentage of the previous years. That's where you get the forty five percent, and that's where traditionally we would normally use forty five percent, with one or two minor exceptions. We would normally set it at forty five percent. To uh, having having provided one vote on account based on a percentage of the nineteen twenty situation, to to then try and sort of change that. Uh, uh, um, I, th I think it would have created more problems than it might have solved to, yeah. to do that. If so so I, I understand it's, it's, it's being used as a measurement tool, if you like. Again, we're in a unique situation where we're in a second vote on account. Mm -hmm. Yes. So again, I don't know even if that's even useful information to you, uh, to us even. Um, so I, I, to know that a budget, to know that a department is going to be 165 per cent over by the time you get to main estimates. That basically what that means. Yes. Uh, and 110 per cent for Department of for Economy. Is that just basically a, a comparison tool, measuring stick for MLAs to pass? Put an account in the house. Y y y yes, but uh, no real use to you as, as financial experts, is it? No. Well, well, I suppose we're obviously focused on what we calculate the departments actually need. Yes. And should that be twenty percent or one hundred and twenty percent? I suppose it doesn't really change our position. But yes, as you say, for for yourselves as uh, as MLAs, it's to to demonstrate how the financial position this year. Uh, is so significantly different than it was last year. It's a fast-moving uh, feast problem, there's no doubt about that. I have every sympathy for you guys uh, at the cold face of this with regards to all the numbers and facts and figures that change on a daily basis. Let's face it. Uh, with every announcement that a minister makes, uh, you probably have to rip up sheets and start over again. So I get that. Uh, and I get that we have to get money down quickly. And so we have had the front load payments to some departments. Surely there is a real concern, you guys being at the helm of this, the levers of power as it, as it were with regards to finances, that you lose control when you front load uh, one with regards to monitoring and also by the fact that the money's went out the door, uh, that the service itself may not be functioned. Is there a real concern around that? And whilst I know that some of this front loading will be going directly into the hands of uh, someone to support them, there may be other amounts of money, substantial amounts of money that's going to pay someone to provide a service who may not last through this. Is there? Any sort of measurement or percentage you've calculated with money at risk of front loading? Do you know uh, what I mean? Well, obviously, the, the allocations that have been made to individual departments are, are all for themselves to measure. Uh, for taking, for example, the Department for Economy is probably the most extreme example of that. Now, uh, the Department for Economy have, have been. Have been given that allocation for a particular purpose. We would certainly be expecting the Department for Economy to be measuring and controlling that. And while that might have been, might not have been possible initially, that is something. It would certainly, as part of the the June monitoring round, which is really going to be the first opportunity for the executive to to take stock of of exactly the things that you've described. Uh, that that's something that 
that we would be expecting to see in terms of the, the returns that departments provide for that. So I, th I think well, we'll be just, in a much better just just come in there. Mm -hmm. Minister, yesterday, quite rightly, we're talking about the need for rates relief and continued rates relief between the hospitality sector and tourism sector. And he made the statement in the Assembly yesterday. He indicated that there wasn't the budget line for it, but they would be relying on and I presume he's talking about we need a June monitoring round to sort of release the figures, the release the money from the departments that haven't spent it to be able to be able to support that coming forward. So therefore the June monitoring round is critical to be able to make sure that we're allowed to keep rates relief going as 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 we go forward, particularly as we're already accounting for that out to the end of the financial year, which is March, obviously March next year. So there's a real issue here with making sure we've got the figures right as we go into the June monitoring round. So and again for the committee, sort of what degree of confidence do you have is that the departments have sufficient um, oversight of where their spending is at the moment? Because you know we're being asked to do a vote on account now out to eighty percent plus COVID allocations, which takes us out until October. But we're already known there's some pressures in the system already. Mm -hmm. So could you just and again I think that probably answer, goes to what Paul's question is a bit. Could you just do that? Jo Joanne will want to come in. Yeah, Joanne. Maybe on it. But can I just say you know, there is a dedicated exercise out with departments. Supply is in daily contact with departments as to their spending levels, their pressures, where the easements are coming. I suppose we've tried as far as we can to constrain the emergency response to a time limited period where it'll be subject to review again. So we have measures in place. We have conditions of approval potentially on these schemes as they go out um, to ensure that we're looking at issues around probity, that we're making sure spend is regular, that it is needed. Um, so we're very, very active uh, and there's a, a focus on these allocations. It's not as if we are just giving the money out and, and letting the departments go go free on it, but uh, Joanne may want to talk on, on the ex express exercise that's going on around the COVID. Yeah, because it's just, and again, just on behalf of the committee, and thank you for your, your, your evidence so far, but looking at 165%, 110%, 100%, 100%, 105%, 105%, rapidly buying up any sort of excess there will be for being able to support sort of rates relief and other issues to do with that. And obviously, if you're doing a regular exercise and you're saying you're doing this basically on a weekly process, you must have an indication of if we are underspending. But you know, from what we're seeing and what you're telling us here, actually the big spending departments are overspending. Chair, um, if I can just yeah, yes, please. jump in there. Um, I think we have to be very careful to keep the separation between this second vote and account, which is really an emergency measure to ensure that departments don't run out of cash. Had we time, we would have preferred, and um, for the reasons Barry set out about the uncertainty, we would have preferred to have done a main estimate. But we simply didn't have the time to do that. There was a risk that departments would not have had the legal authority to draw down the cash to spend the additional allocations we were giving them for COVID. But setting aside that cash issue, departments will be constrained by the allocations that are being agreed and by their budget position for that. And as Emer said, we are monitoring that very closely. The fact that the department is maybe getting over 100% of last year's allocation does not mean that it's spending over 100% of its current year's allocation. That is just a methodology for calculating a vote on account. We are keeping very close track of what departments are spending. The allocations that they're given for COVID-19 response will be ring-fenced for that response, and we'll be monitoring that. In terms of the rates relief, yes, as the minister said, we have effectively overcommitted to allow us to do that. However, we are aware that there are likely to be underspends on the grants that are going out for business rates, and there are other issues where there are certain uncertainties. So we're confident that we will be able to meet and cover that overcommitment. It's not that we're overcommitting it in the hope that departments will surrender money. It is our measured view that we will be able to address that pressure, and this vote on account does not in any way impinge on that. We are monitoring departments' budgets very closely. And this vote in account is, a, is a, an emergency measure to ensure that nobody runs out of cash. Their budgets will be monitored separately to this as well. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, so, so you, I, I take that as you, what you've said, I, I, I understand that because it is a, mass, a fast moving problem scenario that you guys have to deal with. So I, I get that you needed the authority to spend more than the 45 that we had voted for before. Uh, there are. There is the what the chairman alluded to was the I think the minister said just under a hundred million uh, 
over over commit it at this point. Uh, and I know it's not really on this uh, emergency move, but now that we have overcommitted, and we've had to do that, and I think it's a, a no-brainer, the decision that was made yesterday mm -hmm. by the Minister, uh, surely now is the time to be going through the departments and saying, not only where is, your, where is the shortfall, where is the areas where you haven't spent all your allocation, but surely this is the time to go to departments and say, what do you not need to spend? What, what, what are we doing that we actually don't need to do anymore? So, if you like, is there a spring clean going through departments as they say, look, we're in an emergency zone. Households are having to make sacrifices and not spend on things. What, what sacrifices will departments make on things that we don't need to spend money on? Is, is that taking place? Yes. Sorry, I was going to say, if, if I can jump in there again, that is exactly what our the finance minister has written to his ministerial colleagues and asked them to do, and that is something that we'll be taking forward and we'll hopefully be able to report on in the June monitoring round. Obviously, we also need to do our time scales for that, but that is exactly, you're completely correct, that's exactly what we need to do and what each minister needs to do within his existing budget allocation. So, so not to get too political on you, that's, that's obviously all political decisions. Is there any value for money matrix that ministers would <coughs> use in order to come to those decisions? I don't think there's, there's a value for money matrix as such. We will ask each minister and each department to examine um, their current spending plans, the budget that has been agreed for them, and within that, look at pri relative priorities, look at the pressures that are coming out from COVID, what they can do to reprioritise their existing budget to meet those pressures and also are there any places where, as you, you rightly said, where they can stop or reduce things in order to put that money towards higher priority areas and that will be looked at on a, a cross-departmental basis. We're not asking departments to look at it within the silo with their own department but can one department free up money which would allow a higher priority area in another department to be funded. Now, those are decisions for the executive to take but we will be working as officials with our counterparts in those departments to examine all those budget lines, but we don't have a, a precise matrix as such. I mean, there are judgments to be made there. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we'll be gathering that information. One final question to flip the whole thing in its head. Are you concerned whenever departments or organisations don't spend a lot of money in this period? I, I've noticed, and again, this is, this is outside of, the, of your remit, I'm sure, but I've noticed that the Northern Ireland Audit, uh, uh, Utility Regulator didn't get any more money in that fresh allocation. I don't know that she. I don't know that she bid for more money, but I, I see here in Table One that it's basically the sp expenditure is 25 percent of the vote on account as a percentage of 1920. If if I could maybe just come come in on the the utility regulator. The utility regulator is is in a very unusual position in that the vast majority of its expenditure is actually funded by the fees that it charges the industries that it regulates. Yep. So what, what you actually see there is actually just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what its overall expenditure is, but it's all that it needs to be funded by from government. And, and uh, so th that's why we haven't changed the percentage because it was already getting a, a, a essentially the, about 90% in, in the, the earlier vote on account in the year, it was already getting about 90% of the government funding that it needed. Uh, all the additional expenditure that it, that it needs is funded by the fees that it charges to the industry. Yeah, so, but surely in this emergency mode that we're all in, and certainly with energy and water being <laughs> such importance in this, making sure that it continues, Surely there'll be extra pressures on the utility regulator, which won't be able to be uh, accrued from accrued from fees, which are probably a standard set fee. Uh, we we haven't been made aware of any additional pressures as yet. Uh, obviously, if if it comes forward, if the utility regulator comes forward, uh, we can obviously take us on board. And and again, I think that would be something. It, because the utility regulator and the other non-ministerial bodies are all part of the monitoring round process. Right. So certainly in the June monitoring round, if the utility regulator comes forward with additional pressures, they can certainly be considered as well. But they, there have none, to, uh, to my knowledge, have been flagged as of yet.
and, and again the monitoring round was that my next question they're in the same apparatus y yes same yes framework as all the other departments yes right okay thank you chair okay Pat. Uh, thank thanks you. very much chair um thanks very much for coming and presenting today and it's already heard it does it seems to be moving very 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 quickly and I, I do see it changing but i was wondering just that I've noticed, I'm sorry, I have no glasses here today, but on the pots of money which is intended to make provisions for specific purposes, do you have an idea of what those specific purposes are, or are they listed, or have you had discussions with them? That's the first one. I suppose then I would like to go into, you know, our table one and uh, the great executive of the COVID-19 alloc allocation and the difference just uh, between the amount of 584 million, which is the difference which is stated in the budget document, uh, should they not reconcile? I'm, I know it's probably quite simple. I would say the reason for them to try and reconcile. And the, uh, my other, do you want me just to go on with my, all my questions? Sorry, sorry can I just clarify, sorry, yeah. what you would, the, uh, So if you go to, if you go to on, on your document, I think it's page 13, 16.16, uh, 16, and uh, the total, uh, the agreed executive COVID-19 allocation on step three amounts to 584 million. Yes. Uh, there is a difference there, what's stated in the document, uh, on the budget document. I mean, I'm asking, should they not reconcile? Uh, the, the reason was, if you, if you recall, when, when the budget document was published, while some of the executive's initial COVID-19 allocations were able to be included in the published budget document. There were further allocations which came after that, which haven't right. been included. So okay. the, the short, short answer is there are, there are more allocations. And, uh, I thought there would be, but, and then to go in just to, 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 to those uh, money, that, the money that, that was set aside within that part. I mean, is there listings for that? Are those broad? Uh, uh, um, if, if you actually the tables that were that yeah. accompanied the minister's statement to the assembly yesterday right. actually set out uh, With, um, bearing in mind as well that there were some additional allocations even made since our, our tables were provided to you uh, they set out uh, sorry, bear with me. so they'll set out now the, the sum total of, of all the allocations uh, and at the, at the bottom of that table, it feels uh, there are, uh, and I guess referred to as uh, it's just table one. It was, it was a table that accompanied the, the minister's statement to the assembly yesterday. But at the bottom of that, you'll see that there there are a number of what are referred to as centrally held items remaining. So that's the most up to date position where we are in terms of those pots. So, that, for example, there's there's 83.8 in still being held for uh, personal protective equipment, 59.5 million being held uh, for use for the transport sector and then 119.9 which is being held as previously mentioned for business rate support we don't have those figures sure we don't but that uh, what's been held uh, no, no, that, that, well, that, that was just that, given yesterday that, that was on the that table was okay, that was provided yesterday yes. uh, that's good um chair just i was going to then ask you uh, it's uh, i wanted to bring up about the resources to help the self-employed I'm sure you've had some discussions with them, especially those that are in uh, an excess of £50,000 and find their businesses as well. Yes, I hear what's happening with the rates, but is there any allocation set aside for those that don't seem to be getting any help at the moment, or is there any discussions within your department? Um, if, if I could jump in there, Chair. Um, the support that's been provided to self-employed, the existing support is done um, on a UK-wide basis through HMRC. Um, we are in regular discussions with Treasury and we do raise issues where we feel there's gaps in those provisions. But um, as of yet, I'm not aware of any uh, proposals by the Executive um, to provide support to self-employed. I would imagine that that would be through, uh, on a UK-wide basis through HMRC. And I suppose just where the other was on the budget and uh, for a no-deal Brexit, uh, we have talked about the increased costs involved. And there's a document in the DARA pack, which you just got delivered to me this morning because I'm on that committee also, about all the things that still need done before January. How confident is your department that we are yourselves and confident is that you can handle all of those implications? as uh, an old deal or with uh, departmental expenditure limits? 
to join. In that, that scenario, we are working currently working with departments to capture all the costs of the Northern Ireland Protocol and also if there, there is a, a no deal exit, and we will be engaging with Treasury going forward. Um, as I'm sure you appreciate, the, the sort of focus um, over the last few weeks has been on the coronavirus response, yes. but we haven't forgotten about the issues surrounding Brexit, and we have actually been engaging with departments on that. So. Uh, we can never say that we'll, we will be able to address everything, but we're hopeful that we will capture the issues and that we will um, cover them or approach Treasury, if need be, on anything that we feel we can't, we can't address. Because, I mean, these are important as we look at these now, and we're really told that they, they're very fast moving. But in order to come out of this, in order to try and grow the economy again, I mean, there are going to be spends within departments, i.e., it just happens to be uh, our own ministry, but within infrastructure and the money that's there. I mean, that, that will not be all a clawback. You'll also be focusing on trying to come out of this and, and how we do stimulate the economy as well, and the money's. You are looking at them, and, and, and I know it's down into the Department of the Economy as well, but that conversation's going on in your department. Yes, that, that conversation is going on with our department and um, across the, the four nations as well. There are economic workshops with Treasury and, and the full administrations and BEZ. There are We have three weekly phone calls with the Treasury on a range of issues. There's regular engagement between the finance minister, the chief secretary to the treasury and the finance ministers in Scotland and Wales. So all of that engagement is ongoing and it's not only about the COVID-19 response, but it's about the wider issues and about uh, growing the economy and recovery. So yes, all of those discussions are ongoing, obviously in, in early stages, but they are ongoing. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, just before I bring in Matthew, um, I'm just looking at the back of the table and sorry, Jim here does some excellent work for us, but just looking at the vote and account differences between sort of the statement on the 9th of April and where we are at the moment. Now, some of them are quite obvious. You know, DERA is down 28.8 million, uh, communities down 25.8, uh, economy obviously 141.4 down, but health is up 93.8 million, and infrastructure is up 60 million or 59.9 to be accurate. What, what accounts for that? I can't believe that bearing it, we've just seen that sort of health is at 100% of where it was from the original figure. So um, why, why the variation of 93.8 million? Sorry, uh, what, what, what two figures are you comparing there? Sorry. The sort of the minister made a statement on the sort of the 9th of the April, so the um, COVID-19 statement. Yes. And the vote on account that we're being asked to look at now, the variation between them, I can understand the down bit, but what I can't understand is the plus bit. So, you know, health's up 93.8 million and infrastructure's up 59.9 million. So that would indicate that, you know, within that allocation, that's an area they haven't allocated or spent. So I'm not quite sure where that came from. Sorry, I apologise. I, 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 I... If the, the if the minister the minister statement on the 9th of April uh, would have been the, the sort of first the first round or yeah. the first batch of allocations that were made, yeah. but obviously there there have been two more uh, executive agreements to make additional allocations yeah. since then. So I, I would expect any any department that had received any further. Oh, it's just just when you do the figures, it just stands out that health and infrastructure. Health, health for example, in in the announcements. Yesterday, that yeah, the yeah. the finance minister announced, uh, health, for example, re uh, received an additional I think it was 118 million. There, so yes, uh, you know, I would expect. Oh, okay. Uh, well, tell you what, we'll we'll send the question to you for a bit more right. sort of right. example. Right. It just doesn't. It, you know, I can understand all the <laughs> negative bits, the plus bits in health and infrastructure just stand out and go. I'm not quite sure. Well, they, we'll say they, they health and infrastructure are both departments which received additional allocations uh, yeah. as a result of the announcement yesterday. Well, as did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Just shows how generally confused we are at the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask, following uh, a remark that I think Joanne made a few answers ago, she, yeah, I think she said that. Um, the executive or her team expected there to be an underspend uh, in relation to business grants. Can I ask why that is? Um, it's just that we're not facing 
said it obviously when the allocation was made it was on the estimated figures but we're reliant on people applying for those grants and I think the, the, the latest I can't remember what the latest figures are but I think that it shows that the, the costs are coming in lower than anticipated so it's simply a, a, a basis of the estimated cost versus the actual cost. So is that on both the 10,000 and the 25,000 grants? Again, I don't have the figures in front of me at the minute, but yes, that, that is, I mean, we're looking at the two together, but I think it is on both of them that they're coming in slightly below what was originally estimated to be the cost. Okay, but if, I mean, one of the frustrations in the last couple of days has been the um, micro-business fund, which excludes people who are um, sole who employ themselves basically through their business, but they're not, um, they're not, they don't qualify as self-employed, but they've been excluded basically from all forms of support. Um, I suppose I'm just, it, it's helpful to know that they're, um, the reason they have been excluded cannot be, from what you've said, Joanne, that uh, we are maxed out on all the grant schemes. Well, again, um, where, the, where there's gaps in the provision, that, that's something that we, we would need to consider. I mean, the economy and our sales, and um, if it's UK-wide, the, the Treasury. Um, in saying that, DFE were given an allocation for a very specific set of grant schemes. If that money's not spent for those schemes, it comes back to the executive to consider. The executive can decide whether it needs to provide other support. That's a decision to be made. In the interim, it has been decided that the rates would be extended to the end of the financial year. And bearing in mind that resulted in an overcommitment, that was done in the knowledge that the estimated cost of the grant schemes already in place, excluding the micro business, which obviously is still in its early days, but the two schemes that have been established for a while. So that was done in the knowledge that those costs were coming, the actual costs were coming in lower than the estimate. Right. Okay. So the specific there is was a specific linkage in a discussion at executive level about an under an expected underspend in relation to grants, and that was a spe there was a specific linkage made between that underspend and the extension of the rates holiday. There, there was. A, a discussion, um, obviously I wasn't at the executive meeting, but I, I believe that it was said that there was an anticipated underspend. Now, at that time, and we still don't have the actual figures because I don't think it closes, those two schemes close until this evening. So we don't have exact, exact figures, but we do know that based on the figures to date, it did look lower, and that would have been something to be taken into account. There was a range of issues taken into account, and there are a range of uncertainties around the funding we have. Uh, even the Barnet figures we are getting from Treasury are, at this point, completely uncertain because Whitehall departments are also working through a range of uncertainties and some of our Barnet will be dependent on actual costs at Whitehall as well. So the executive is trying to manage a range of uncertainties here and it is a, a, a decision has to be taken and a judgment call has to be taken about the need to provide okay. support at, at the point at which you do that compared to the point at which you have certainty on the finances. Okay, if I may Chair, I just wanted to ask, go back with a slightly more uh, general question which is, if anyone really, could you give me a definition of what a centrally held item is and where the, the guidance exists for a centrally held item? I'm sure it's quite a basic question, but it would be helpful to know. You won't find, I wouldn't imagine, any guidance which defines a centrally held item. What it means in our context is that it is money that the executive has effectively ring fenced for a purpose, but which it has not yet allocated to a department. So in some ways it is held by the Department of Finance, by our own people in PSD, ring fenced to say, say for the transport fund, that this funding has been agreed by the executive that that will be used for transport support measures, but we don't yet have enough detail on those measures. So we will not give it, say, to the Department for Infrastructure yet, but we will hold that until we have the detail we need to do that. And the same for the business rate support. We've, we've said, shown it as, as being centrally held because the rates paper was also going through at the same time. So we've done that. So it, it's money that has been ring-fenced by the executive for a purpose but has not yet been allocated to a department. Okay. Uh, one of the items, just turning to on, uh, the budget document, one of the items that's centrally held um, for 2021 is an item I think that's been centrally held for the last few years, which is air passenger duty. <laughs> which, um, Go for it, Matthew. Go for point, it. £2.3 <laughs> million pounds, uh, has been being centrally held. It would be helpful to understand um, uh, how that uh, money is held. There are different depictions of that. It, it, it looks to this like it, th this is money that is transferred back to the Exchequer, the, as in the UK Exchequer, and there are other descriptions of it as a reduction in the block grant. If one of you would be able to give us, a, I'm sure, a, a, um, a version of, of what that centrally held item is. Yes. Sorry, when, when I was uh, 
um, and since that was held, I was there. I was looking at it in the context of the numbers you're looking at for the COVID-19 response, which means money the executive is ringed Yes, yes. There are other centrally held items, which would be for um, sort of pressures which don't necessarily sit with one department, but which would, mm-hmm. the executive's budget would have to pay for, such as interest payments, etc. And the air passenger duty um, is one of those things. When the decision was taken by the executive to devolve air passenger duty for long-haul flights, there were discussions with the Treasury, which I have to say wasn't, I wasn't involved in at that time. But the discussions with the Treasury and state aid rules meant that we had to, basically the executive had to pay for that. And that was done through, and it's whether you say we transfer it back to the exchequer or, or, or it's a reduction to our block grant, effectively they are the same thing. It means that the executive sale is reduced by the amount of that. And, and that is a figure that is agreed by Treasury each year, and we hold that money for that. And I think we have answered, um, other parts of the Department of Finance have answered some questions on that to yourself Indeed. about the whys and wherefores of why that has, has no, been the case. Indeed, I don't, I don't worry, I won't bore you with the history. Um, I'll bore other people if they want with the history. I find it's quite a, a lurid but fascinating story. Um, am I right though in saying that the reason that you, my understanding is the Department of Finance can't go back to Treasury and say, look lads, why are we paying you this? We haven't had a long haul flight in two years and not only that, global aviation has collapsed. We're unlikely to have a long haul flight in the near future. Um, and by the way, we have a crisis in short haul aviation and connectivity to GB, which is critical. Um, the reason you can't do that is that it was put into primary legislation um, that this um, mechanism, this rebate, this reduction of the block grant would happen. Is that right? I, uh, sorry, I honestly couldn't comment on that. I don't have any of the, the background to that, so I'm, I'm not aware of that being the case. I'm not aware of it being the case or not being the case, but it's certainly something that we can answer. We can go back to other parts of the department to get an answer for. Okay, and just one very final quick one, not on this subject, if I may. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the area, one of the, the, the few areas of um, uh, not revenue raising as in tax raising, but areas of resource from which the executive is able to draw is. Um, borrowing, uh, RRI borrowing as it's known. Um, at the, can I just double check? My understanding is that there is still some, you may say it's another bit of the department to, to answer me, that's fine, but that there's still some headroom in the executive's RRI borrowing limits. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's, that's completely right. The RRI borrowing limit is agreed um, with Treasury. Usually it's part of the UK spending review. It's, at the moment, it's sitting at 200 million for 2021. The executive budget didn't actually access any of that borrowing. Mm-hmm. So there, there is the headroom there to do so this year. We have to be aware that borrowing is only for capital purposes. So it's for you know creating assets, but it's not can't be used for pay costs or for Indeed. general grants to businesses, etc. But yes, that, that headroom is there and that is something that the executive may want to consider as we move forward. Of course, any borrowing comes with costs attached to it. Yeah, um, and those costs that are resource dealt, so those are all things that have to be considered before the decision is taken to borrow. And, that, and that's my, my, my final question, if I may, Chair, just on the, on the cost point. Is it written down, it may be written down somewhere, and I just don't know it, so apologies for me using you to do my homework, Joanne, or others. Um, the, the specific interest rate that is linked to, where is it written down, the interest rate that we have to borrow? Is it UK bond deals at a certain moment? I ask this question because... People may have noticed that today, for the first time, UK borrowing costs turned negative, which, and as is happening with lots of other sovereigns, so it is extremely cheap to borrow. How is it calculated? The borrowing cost for the institutions here, at what, um, what sort of, what point in the in the in the in the kind of year do we have to take the the, the yield or the borrowing costs from? Okay, um, we borrow from the National Loans Fund, yeah. so it is whatever the National Loans Fund rate is on the day we take out the loan. Now, we can't borrow just 200 million in no, general. No. Yeah. It, our borrowing has to be linked to individual capital projects, yeah. and we have to borrow monthly in advance. So um, the way the borrowing works is we would identify when, when the executive takes a decision to borrow, we identify capital projects which are suitable for borrowing, so usually something with a long asset life attached to it. You don't want to be borrowing to buy vehicles, for example. You'd rather borrow to buy a building or a road. We then have to go to that department and get monthly profiles of the expenditure, and we borrow them monthly in advance based on those profiles of expenditure. So there are a variety of interest rates for our RI borrowing that we access in any given year. Yeah. But they will, um, be linked to the, the, they, they will ultimately be linked to the UK borrowing costs, the sovereign well, borrowing costs. 
Yes, but but not exactly because it will be whatever they will be linked to that. But it's through the National Loans Fund. Yeah. So it's whatever the National Loans Fund rate is in that day, and it's pub- the National Loans Fund rates are published on a website which anyone can access the Public Works Loans Board, so you can see what the interest rates are on any given day from that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. So, uh, can I take it then that the SDLP are using this proposal to support the York Street interchange then by borrowing two hundred million? I'd have to go and check that with my uh, <laughs> someone more senior to me. <laughs> Certainly in favour of uh, using borrowing. Could be more of the railway yeah. line yeah. from yeah. Lisburn. Uh, <laughs> Jane Emer Barrett, just before I finish, um, we know uh, about a year and a half ago uh, when we didn't have an executive up and running. We had a crisis when we looked as if we needed to. We were running out of cash, and our departments were reaching the sort of the 85% limit. And there was lots of discussions ongoing about the sort of rules and how we needed to take through legislation through in Westminster to enable us to do that. The exam question is here: We are at a significant crisis point in Northern Ireland. We're a significant crisis point for many of our departments and for our businesses and the rest of it. We are being asked to approve up to 80% plus COVID up to October. The exam question is, is that sufficient headroom for our department to be able to deal with which could be potentially a second wave? What are our options if it looks as if, if we agree to this, bearing in mind it is 80%, percent why are we not looking to increase it out to 95%? because we have got some really significant potential problems in the summer that we need to be about. So, you know, and I think, so looking around the committee, and we will talk about the committee about this afterwards, but by going for 80 per cent, you are, in some respects, maybe constraining yourselves, because we are not out of COVID by any stretch of the imagination. It, it is a judgment that we have tried to make, and, and you are quite correct, because three months ago we did not think we were going to be in this situation. And, and anybody who says they, they know what the situation is going to be in another three months' time is probably filling themselves. Uh, uh, had, had we brought a, a much larger vote on account to you, um, I think we would have had difficulty in justifying the fact that we were effectively taking your ability to make a decision on, on the main estimates in the next budget bill. Uh, in an informed way. So, uh, based based on the information we have now, we believe that this is sufficient. But if if, if another you know if another wave of pandemic strikes and there is very significant additional Barnet allocations coming from the UK government to fund the executive, who in turn uh, make decisions about future allocations, then we we will have to come back to the assembly f- for approval. But our focus, our focus now is is the main estimates, as yes. Mr. Alistair said at the very start. You know, we need, we need to get a main estimate through, and we need to get it back on a, on a normal footing, and not be relying. On but, the but Chair, does this, does this also mean that we are giving authority to spend in round figures 80% of the year's budget <coughs> in the first seven months? That's uh, that's correct. That's correct. What happens, as, what as, happens to the last five months? As, 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 uh, now, there, there's a couple, couple of things just to, to bear in mind. Uh, as I think we discussed the, the last time we were here, there is also the accruing resources which departments will yeah. receive. So while, while it would be 80 per cent of the net spend or the, you know, oh. the spend that's drawn from the consolidated fund, that uh, in addition to that, there would also be the further accruing resources, which is the receipts which departments will be bringing in. So it's not 80% of their total spend, but it's certainly 80% of the cash that they would cash. be looking to draw from the yeah. consolidated fund. Uh, and temper that as well as, as uh, Amer explained in the opening statement, that an, a lot of departments are having to front load a lot of their expenditure to the early part of the year, again as part of the. COVID response. So, for example, if there's a voluntary community sector organisation or some other organisation which will receive, for sake of argument, a million pounds grant in a year, and we, that would normally be divided up by 12, so to receive a, a twelfth of that every month. In a number of cases, they've been getting significantly higher uh, portion of that grant at the start of the year. 
in recognition of the fact that their other sources of income have dried up. But obviously, the, the, there's still only a million pounds at the beginning, and the, the grants that they'll receive later. But, but what happens the last half of the year? Well, that, we'll obviously be, be looking at that. But the, the expectation would be that as we come out of the the uh, lockdown period, that there are other sources of income that they might have start to come back up, so that they can uh, uh, rebalance their their books. Mm. So, what happens when we do the June monitoring round and discover that we're not getting the savings and the potential uh, transfers that we need? Can I maybe refer to Joanne? For <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, I'll, I'll jump in there, but I'm going to apologise in advance. This phone line is breaking up very badly, so I'm only hearing um, part of the conversation. Um, I think we have to bear in mind that while we're giving departments a vote of time in excess of 80% of last year's money, and that does allow them to spend a considerable amount of this year's budget, they are also constrained by their budget position. So departments can only spend up to the budget they have at the moment, and yes, we will want to look for savings in gym monitoring and reprioritisation. And if we do not get that, then we may need to curtail what we are spending things on. But this vote and account will not impact on that in that way because it is the budget position which will drive the decisions which are made on where we spend the money. The vote on account is the mechanism to allow the departments to spend the money in line with those budget decisions which have been taken. Okay, thanks. Gemma, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, do you want to any, ask any questions, Gemma? I just have one really quick question, um, and it's about departments retaining cash received through receipts. What does that mean? Uh, this is uh, what I, I mentioned earlier on. Is it's referred to as an accruing resource. So there's a uh, power in the Government Resource and Accounts Act, uh, Northern Ireland 2001, which allows uh, subject to a uh, budget bill uh, authorising it in the Assembly allows the Department of Finance to give a direction, or sorry, to, to lay a minute, to direct departments to retain cash. So, for example, if, if a department is providing a service for which there is a charge, then the income that that receives can be retained to offset against the cost of delivering the service. Um, now, this uh, this budget bill will because it's only for a vote on account, will not be seeking the authority to do that. But uh, in a, a normal budget bill that would accompany a main estimates, there would be, in one of the schedules, there would be a separate column listing the receipts which departments are estimating that they will be bringing in for the year. And there would be a, 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 an additional clause in the bill itself, which will then authorise the use of those receipts as an accruing resource. Mm. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Are you happy, Gemma? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, committee, any further questions? You're smiling now. Is it? <laughs> Joanne Eamer, Barry, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for your evidence. And we look forward to, no doubt, seeing you again soon. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, team, we've heard the evidence from the department. And the question is, uh, bearing in mind we've heard this evidence and bearing in mind the pressures we have in the system, are we content to uh, grant accelerated passage of the bill? And if members are content, <coughs> are we content? Accelerated passage now seems to be first and second stage all in the one day. Mm. We're getting very accelerated. Yeah. Why is that? I think the committee was notified uh, last week, maybe, that the, I think it's standing order 42.5, is it, for five, two. Five, getting the bill through in less than 10 days? Five. Yes, but normally it would be at least a day in between. Yeah, now it's a day. <laughs> it's uh, lunchtime. It possibly is the fear of the Department of the Economy running out of resources before the final stage of the budget bill. Or is it just because the Assembly is sitting one day a week? I think it's probably because they, I, I, I would probably need to take reflection and I'll talk with the I'll actually talk with the um, liaisons committee but I imagine it's because we're only sitting one day a week yeah. so members are we content yes. in that case allow me to read this out 
Uh, the Committee for Finance is satisfied that there has been appropriate consultation with it on the public expenditure proposals contained in the Budget No. 2 Bill 2020 and is content to grant accelerated passage to the Bill in accordance with Standing Order 42.2. If accelerated passage is agreed, agreed. That the Committee writes to the Speaker to reflect the sentiments expressed and to confirm that it is content that the Bill should pass under the accelerated passage procedure as per Standing Order 42.2. Uh, move on to item number five on the agenda, written evidence in your monitoring of public expenditure 2022 guidelines. I like to remind members in February 20, the Committee asked the Department to provide details of the year's in year monitoring public expenditure guidelines 2021. Uh, the Department has provided the in-year monitoring of public expenditure guidelines at page 87, 2021 outturn and forecast outturn guidelines at page 146, and the raised paper of in-year monitoring on 2021 tabled at page 3. Uh, I advise the members that the guidance takes much more account of the needs of the Assembly Committee than previously been the case. Do we have any comments? Uh, can I seek your agreement to note the guidance? Yeah. I seek agreement to forward the raised paper to the Department requesting a response to the scrutiny points raised in time for the oral evidence session on in-year monitoring at next, year, next week's meeting. Are we content? content? Item number six, Chairperson's Business. There is no Chairperson's Business. We move on to number seven, Correspondence. Uh, advise members on page 196 is the list of correspondence with actions suggested. Um, Department response regarding Northern Ireland screen funding legislation is pages 200. Would you care to make a comment on that, Jim? Well, I think it's uh, <laughs> be very good. I'd be that. very surprised if you uh, did. <laughs> they're going to make themselves legal. <laughs> About time. Okay. Can I have your agreement to note that uh, piece of correspondence? Noted. Uh, departmental response regarding the Northern Ireland Legend and Entertainment Forum on page 203. Members, do we have any comments? Uh, could I have your agreement to forward the response to the forum for information? And uh, to the departmental regarding, uh, could we have that? Uh, sorry, apologies, I got lost there. Uh, to forward the response to the forum for information. Great. 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 Yeah. Uh, if I like to look at the departmental's uh, response regarding response to dilapidation payments, page two hundred five. Paul, have you any comments? Yeah, uh, whilst they've tabled it out in a uh, very good fashion in Table A uh, with regards to the uh, properties, the identification of properties, the amount claimed and the settlement amount, they, they still don't answer how those figures vary so much. You know, how can someone make a claim for, there's one there, uh, number three, uh, 261 thousand seven hundred if I'm reading that figure right and they've settled for thirty five thousand. Yeah. Where uh, where is the logic in, in this? Now I know it's a claim and there's, there's a challenge, but how do you go from one claim to that challenge and that settlement? Now that speaks to me as if there's a lot of really unhappy people out there. Uh, or a lot of optimistic ones. Or a lot of us optimistic ones. Somewhere along the line <coughs> someone has got their figures wrong. Uh, now, it, it could be the case that the department has been very prudent and fighting for every single pound they can, which is commendable. Uh, but also, they're, they're getting these properties off the private sector, who ha have businesses to run also. So I, what, I, what I'm looking for and what I'm seeking is balance. Is there a real balance here? Uh, that there's no... I need to watch my language, but we wouldn't want to see a big, powerful department coming down heavy on on people who own properties and who have the department has availed of these properties for a number of years, many years maybe in some cases, and then basically layered into the the owner and left him with a really or her with a really bad taste in their mouth. I just I, I don't I see the figures. I just don't see the the logic and the human story in this, and I think there is one, and I just need to see where the balance is. Well, hadn't we one company that wrote to us? 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do we know if they're sorted or not? I don't think we have that. They they did. There was a settlement. Yeah. But I don't think that's noted in the in the correspondence. Uh, and I may be delving on the legal side of things here with regards to, because obviously a settlement has been agreed. Now I don't know whether that's inside or outside of a tribunal or a court setting. I don't know, or whether that's just something that's agreed outside of that forum. But I think we'd, I would just like to know, have more commentary on each one of these cases. Because there is some massive differentials there. That there's only one that I think was agreed. Was, I think there's only one that was settled with the same amount. If I'm right, where would, did I see it? No, yeah, I didn't. Number, number six. six. Number six. Number six. So whilst, whilst it's the smallest number, you know, what's the difference between that one and the rest? And of course, that only took four months. I think the person who wrote to us was agreed more about the time scale rather than the actual amount. But here, this shows up massive variations in amounts. Um, through, the, through the committee, uh, and I just want to slightly open the conversation. I, that struck me as the difference between um, what was being claimed and what was being settled on. Now, as a people who are there to make sure that the public purse is well looked after, in some respects, it's good to see that the uh, LPS has been so proficient at sort of driving down the bill. But there's another question here: is that there does seem to be a remarkable difference between what is they're either over egging uh, what they're expecting, and the settlement is a realistic figure. Or there is some process here where these companies feel as if, because of the time length, they want to settle just because that's what it's likely to be. Um, and I think maybe we could probably look at potentially doing one or two case studies to get some more sort of um, analysis of this, maybe to answer your question, uh, Arias. Deputy Chair. Arias. Arias. Uh, could we have a proposer and a seconder of that, and we could push that on to Rays for some investigation? Happy yeah, enough to. Happy enough. That, yeah. You need to give us a formal proposal there, Paul, yeah, so we can get it. I, I certainly propose that we, we, we seek research on, on these, whether it be one or two case studies or whether they have the ability and the capability to go through them all. Uh, I just think there's a story here, and I, I would like to hear it. I propose. Yeah, you propose. Lisa? Yeah, just um, the very fact that there's been a settlement, does that not imply it's been agreed as well, too? Uh, and that. Um, this ground has already been dealt with. You know, what real input can we have in it after that? Yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can take your point, Melissa. And you know, one part of me says it's great that the department has been able to sort of drive those costs down significantly to the public purse. But there is, there is, there is definitely a, a pattern here, and I just want us to be certain that there isn't other practices that are ongoing. And I think anybody who's been involved in the business community. Would probably have saw those would have sort of come to the conclusion that they've been forced I, down. I'm glad to. Up. I'm glad to second it. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to the next, uh, Nilga requested to brief the committee re local government financial concerns arising from COVID. Page two hundred eight. Ask members if you have any comments. Well, I Jim. think was that not written before the initiative? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. By DFP yesterday. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see what the councils make. Will that help them bridge the huge gap of funding deficit they're facing? Yeah. And I sort of I got from the discussions with the Minister for Communities and also for the Minister of Finance is that whereas the delta for the um, councils is somewhere in the region, I think of about between forty and forty eight million. So the twenty million from now and see what happens in the autumn, I think there is uh, indication that there will be support there. But um, I'll be interested to see what that is. Uh, sorry, there's agreement here to request a written briefing from Nilga advising them that the committee should have a better picture of the position in relation to the councils once it's considered the June monitoring information on, uh, on in June. I think that would be a, a clear thing. And maybe we'd go back to Nilga at that point if we're content. Content? Uh, correspondence from members of the public regarding the non-domestic rates and the UUEPC report, page 209. Uh, members, have you any comments? Thank like your agreement to note. 
Great. Uh, well, I think it's changed from yesterday. Yeah, I think most it, of it has. It's yeah. Changed, but maybe you know if a member of the public would write to us again with regards yeah. to the new environment. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think we have to acknowledge the department. We raised this issue several yeah. times. The department has moved it has been a long way on this issue, and you know we're always being very critical. No, I think we've done a lot. But you know, uh, to the announcement again. Uh, yes, it was yesterday, wasn't it? Yes, uh, things are moving that fast. It has gone a long, long way to help a lot of non-domestic ratepayers. Yep. I think I think Claire Sugden raised one of the remaining issues mm -hmm. that B and Bs who are paying domestic rates but can't operate are getting no relief. I think that really is a problem. Well, because those are the people who are not employing anybody. They're yeah. probably doing it yeah. as a, a partner, you know, wife, and, uh, husband and wife team, uh, paying domest domestic rates. They, those are people who are still stuck, uh, most definitely. Uh, next item Thank from... Sure. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I mean, that was part of the reason why I raised that with those that find themselves uh, with the rateable value over that £51,000. Yes, they have got the extension through the Minister yesterday, and I do have to welcome that. But it is what it is. It's a lifeline. And uh, th th there is no income coming in there. But at least, you know, for some businesses that were maybe paying sixty or £70,000 rates, at least that burden is now lifted off them and they can focus as this thing progresses. And maybe, just maybe with a bit of hope and goodwill, they will be able to get opened again. Mm -hmm. I think I'll take from um, what uh, Jim said and what you said, Pat, and I think maybe from this committee, because you're quite right, we are yeah. sometimes overly critical of the department and what the process is, but I think we need to recognise that the, com the department has moved, has listened, and I think that's appropriate if we uh, recorded that. Jim. Chairman, yes, I'd endorse that. And what Pat has said, clearly, as each issue has been raised, the department has tried to move to help. We're still left with a core mm. group of people, relatively small, but a core group who have fallen between all of the stools. Mm. And I would like to put that on the agenda for next week's meeting that we discuss what we can do for those people, because they're seeing very generous grants and federal mm. payments being made to businesses around them. But due to technicalities, they have, for instance, the person who has half of his incomes employed and the other is half self-employed. He's not entitled to anything. Interesting. The, yeah, so some of this, of course, is, is land and property services. Some of it's HMRC. Some of it's Department of the Economy. But I think there's enough of it within the billywork of our department to make a contribution on this, because those businesses, if they don't get anything, will go to the wall. I think in the forward work programme, where we're looking at the UEPC to come and talk to us and talk about sort of the programmes. That maybe it would be appropriate if we got that as part of the process, because we'll probably need to do some research, because we can probably all think of some small area that's fallen between the cracks. But look at that as a specific area, so they can look at that and bring that to the to the research. Chair, if we look at the amount of money, I mean, we've heard there was a savings. We don't know what yet between the 10k and the 25k grant. So, I mean, there must be, there probably is scope to them, I have to say, but we do have to recognise what Jim has already said there, that the department has come up and stepped forward and alleviated a lot of the fears of a lot of businesses that are out there. There are those that have fallen through, and I would endorse that, being written to as well. Jim, have you got a specific proposal you want to put? Yeah, the hardship fund was announced, it's, it's opening today actually, yeah. very, very good, apart from the one proviso that a single person yeah. On their own, cannot obtain any form of funding from it. Now, if that was removed, that would be a huge benefit to everybody. So, what I'm proposing is, is that we and perhaps try and get uh, the evidence from the group next week, if possible, and discuss what the last piece of the jigsaw is to support not a huge number of people, <coughs> people who feel left out. Of the of the, of the largesse and it is it's very generous. I, I think, Chair, um, the economy minister I think was in front of her committee this morning, and I certainly know that issue was going to be raised. So it might be worth checking. If there was any advance on that? I, I just sort of taking a sounding around the, yeah. the committee. I think, Jim, there is um, a, a feeling that yes, we should we should look at that and look at the opportunity to do that. Sir so, Melissa, do you want to come in? Yeah, it's just it's ironic that uh, uh, our evidence today was that there has not been the uptick yeah. uh, that one expected, and yeah. yet at the same time we can all identify some of these hurdles. 
whether it was even in terms of um, uh, people producing a, a license or an Irish passport, uh, and then in addition, people who find themselves in particular uh, with that hardship fund, because I was expecting it maybe to be much broader and uh, that it would have addressed the needs of many uh, individuals again too that I know that uh, uh, have had difficulty in accessing funding. But I do think too that it actually requires probably for the groundwork here yeah. in this because other than that we could all sit here and quote example after example but we need something more specific to concentrate we'll say, and the, the, the focus we'll say, within the meeting itself. Can uh, maybe through the, the clerk, Jim and Paul and I if we sort of explore sort of the questions we would do and then circulate amongst the committee for next week if you're content, Jim? Yes, my mother. Could we have an input into that, Chair? Hmm? Could we through a letter or have we maybe if you know when we see your questions? Oh yeah, no, we'll, circul we'll circulate, circulate around all of you. Sure, sorry, we'll get, get your input. It speaks to me, Chair, that we won't actually have we won't have the means to develop a scheme. What we'll have to do I Just look think at what there is. can do is identify the people who have fallen through <clears throat> Yeah. And, and make sure we have the full wide range of people who have fallen through in order to give it to somebody, a minister, mm -hmm. to, to say, look, please wrap a scheme around these people. Okay. Uh, I think that's where we're at. Uh, and then we're content. I think we can move on. Um, uh, item from the Assembly EU Affairs Manager regarding the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol VAT provisions on page 214. Uh, members, have we any comments? But, Chair, I, I thought the questions from the Scrutiny Committee at Westminster are extremely probing mm -hmm. and very pertinent to the situation that we may be facing. So I'd certainly like to be kept informed as to the response they receive. Presumably that will happen. Yes. The yes, uh, last paragraph says I uh, expect a comprehensive reply by the end of this month. So yeah. uh, we can ask the uh, EU Affairs. Yes, so, manager. so to seek agreement of the EU Affairs Minister to keep the committee fully appraised of any developments as we go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Bearing in mind, we've just seen the command paper that's gone out this afternoon that, uh, to say the least, is not exactly detailed. Um, and I think this is an area we need to keep a very close eye on, particularly to do with sort of VAT, VAT provisions and the rest of it, which very much indeed come within the purview of this committee and might. Uh, be an, ever, an area of work that we need to look at in the autumn. Okay, thank you. Um, next item was the Committee for Communities regarding the raised paper on coordinated budget scrutiny on page 221. And four members uh, tabled at page 15 as a draft response to the chairperson for the Committee for Communities. Members, do we have any comments? I like your agreement to forward the response to the Committee for the Communities. Great. 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 Uh, from the Committee for Justice regarding the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, do you have any comments? Are we content to note? Okay. Note. Uh, seek agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence and to note the information request to the Department of Routine Papers issued on the 15th of May 2020. Are we content? Okay. Yep. Uh, if we now move on to the Forward Work Programme. And for right, Chair, can sorry. I can I raise something on or request for departmental information? Uh, this is a, a table I keep an eye on very, very gravely. Uh, if I'm reading it right, we still haven't had a response on the PPE issue yeah. um, and the missing day <coughs> with regards to the email thread. I'm just wondering if we and and it's. Missed the pack. Sure, as, as Sir. response has been received since the packs oh. out, so it will be included in papers at next week's meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number eight in the agenda: the forward work program. The updated forward work program for April to July is now at page two three eight. Members, are we content with the forward work program? Chair, sure, I mentioned to the clerk on the seventeenth of June. There's some evidence on my bill, but on the same day, I'm giving evidence to the executive committee on that. So he's going to try and coordinate those two. Okay. Uh, any other business members? Uh, we're about to move on to the closed session and consider the committee's draft strategic plan. But just before that, I just need to say. The date and time of the next meeting is Wednesday, the 27th of May, 2020, at 2:30 here at the Senate Chamber. Just so you note that, 
And in that case, can we now move on to closed session? Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. <laughs>